Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Wireless Recording Technologies for In Vivo Electrophysiology in Conscious, Freely Behaving Non-Human Primates. This is Haley McCaffrey from Inside Scientific, and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Triangle Biosystems International and will include two research case studies highlighting the use of new head-mounted implantable wireless sensors for investigating neural processes in vivo. First, we will hear from members of the Hatsopolis Lab run by Dr. Nico Hatsopolis at the University of Chicago. They are investigating what features of motor behavior are encoded and how this information is represented in the collective activity of neuronal ensembles in the motor cortex, premotor, and somatosensory cortices. Today, they will present methodology and preliminary data from research using a 64-channel wireless head stage on marmosets. The objective of this research is to explore sensorimotor encoding across marmosets behavioral repertoire. Following, we will hear from members of the Hayden Lab, run by Dr. Benjamin Hayden at the University of Minnesota. They are currently focused on the neural basis of choice. The team records the activity of single neurons during real choices in order to parcel out the contributions of frontal lobe structures to reward-based choices. They will present a case study in which they have successfully implemented the 128-channel head stage in macaques. While, perf per while performing a center out joystick task in a primate chair and discuss the promise their results show for future studies using untethered wireless recordings in freely moving and behaving animals. So um, I've been interested for the past 20 years in the cortical control of the upper limb, including the arm and the hand. And I've been focused mainly on um, macaque monkeys uh, using highly constrained behaviors. Uh, and over the years, uh, partly because of the department I'm in, which emphasizes neuroethology, I've been trying to develop more unconstrained behaviors and studying how the brain controls these unconstrained behaviors. So, um, that was one motivation for going to a wireless system. Um, uh, at the same time, several years ago, I began a collaboration with uh, Jason McLean and Nicholas Brunel uh, studying uh, using the marmoset as an animal model uh, because of its uh, lysencephalic cortex. Its smooth cortex allows us to record easily from these different brain areas, uh, cortical areas, as well as doing optical imaging. And uh, we, or Jeff, who spearheaded this project, um, soon realized um, that it was very hard to, to, to get any kind of behavior in highly constrained contexts. So that really pushed us to go to the wireless system where we could record brain activity during unconstrained uh, forging tasks and other kinds of behaviors of involving the arm and the hand. So that led us to working with TBSI where we they helped us uh, uh, develop a custom-made version of their system to work for the marmoset. And, and Jeff I, was really the driver of this uh, redesign uh, together with TPSI and, and then implemented this system uh, in behaving marmosets. So Jeff will now talk about what he's been doing. Thanks, Nico. Um, so there's a growing interest in the common marmoset as a model species because of the prospect of transgenics and the accessibility of cortical areas that would otherwise be buried in the sulci of other primates. Um, despite this growing interest, the field has, uh, has comparably little experience with training marmosets in behavioral neuroscience experiments. And there is some indication that the standard approaches developed with macaques might be ill-suited to marmosets. Uh, for example, while a macaque may routinely sit for multiple hours engaging in an experimental task, marmosets will generally not sit still for much more than a half an hour. With this in mind, we sought to develop a training approach that would allow us to fit our experimental tasks within the marmoset's behavioral repertoire, rather than attempt to force the marmoset to work within the experimental constraints normally placed on non-human primates in neuroscience. 
In practice, this means using a behavioral training apparatus that attaches to the marmoset's home cage and a wireless system for neural recordings. In what follows, I'll describe this apparatus and summarize marmoset's behavior within it. Then I'll describe the development of our wireless neural recording setup that allows us to take advantage of the in-home cage behavioral training approach. So here's an illustration of one version of this apparatus. Um, the apparatus attaches to the marmoset's home cage so that multiple marmosets can voluntarily participate in training throughout the day with minimal experimenter involvement. And so here are a couple of photos to illustrate what this looks like. Um, on the left, we can see the apparatus on top of the home cage. And on the right, we can see a close-up with a marmoset engaging and foraging within the apparatus. And so here's a short video to illustrate what a session of behavior within the apparatus looks like. Um, the marmoset enters the apparatus from the home cage below uh, and engages in some foraging, uh, looks around a bit, and is free to leave whenever it wants. Um, if we log the duration and distribution of these sessions within and across days, we can get a picture of the marmoset's everyday foraging activity. And so we've done just this to produce the following figures. Uh, this figure summarizes about 10 days of behavior. Each session within the apparatus is represented as a point where session duration is in seconds uh, on the y-axis and time of day is on the x-axis. The first thing we notice is that marmosets visit the apparatus throughout the day pretty much from when they wake up to when they go to sleep. Uh, the second thing that we notice is the most of their visits last around 10 seconds, but some last as long as five minutes. Looking at the distribution of session durations makes this second point even more clear. We can see here that the bulk of their visits to the apparatus are under 20 seconds, with 90% of them under 50 seconds. There are, however, a handful that last longer than a couple of minutes. These estimates actually accord well with field observations of marmosets' activity budgets, which estimate that marmosets engage in foraging activity and gum feeding in short spurts on the order of a few seconds throughout the day. Um, none of their visits, however, last anywhere close to how long standard approaches to training non-human primates in neuroscience would require. These findings further strengthen our resolve that if we wanted to work with marmosets within marmoset's natural behavioral repertoire, we would need a neural recording setup that would be flexible enough to adapt to it. And this is what led us to the wireless head stages from TBSI. In the next few slides, I'm going to des describe our efforts to develop a neural recording setup that would satisfy a few design constraints. One, it would allow for recording neural activity during unconstrained behavior. Uh, two, it would require minimal and infrequent handling of the marmosets to mount and maintain the head stage. And three, it would have a low profile on the head of the animal. Um, so we're using the 96 channel Utah array to target marmoset center, sensory motor cortex. Uh, so I'll start by describing the surgical approach and build up the recording setup from there. Um, so the standard approach to mounting neural recording hardware to the head of marmosets usually involves cutting the temporalis muscles to make room for a mound of bone cement uh, used to fix the neural recording hardware to the skull. Um, so we saw an opportunity to refine this approach by replacing the mound of bone cement with a custom titanium pedestal to which the connector for the Utah array is fixed. Uh, this pedestal is inspired by the approach taken to human orthopedic implants and represents a refinement for a few reasons. Um, first, the uh, transcutaneous object of the pedestal, the stalk shown in the top right panel, is of minimal diameter, just three millimeters. Um, 
Second, the geometry of the feet of the pedestal uh, are such that they respect the insertion of the temporalis muscles so that we don't have to cut them in surgery. Um, and third, the, the feet of the pedestal are coated with hydroxy, hydroxy appetite, uh, which promotes osseointegration. Um, on top of the pedestal sits a custom removable fixture that holds the electrode array connector in place. Um, this removable fixture provides the opportunity for array replacement, which would be much more difficult if the connector was embedded in a mound of bone cement. Um, so after the array implantation, uh, this is how the preparation looks. For recording, we've designed a, a helmet to serve as the base for the components of the wireless head stage. The helmet sits on top of the fixture for the array connector. And we've, we've worked with PBSI to arrive at a, a modular version of the W64 head stage that has a low profile and that allows minimal handling of the animals. It comprises a multiplexing accelerometer package in the back of the head and an RF transmitter battery package that sits on the front of the head. Um, the multiplexer package attaches to the array connector with three, with two 34-pin omnetics connectors. Uh, these connectors require precision and, and force to mate, which translates into handling and restraint. So we don't remove the MUX package after each recording session. Instead, we only remove the RF transmitter battery package with its three pin connector when the battery needs to be charged. Uh, to protect the MUX accelerometer package, we have a custom 3D printed housing that mates with the helmet. And to, to protect the RF transmitter battery package, we have another 3D printed housing that mates with the helmet and the MUX housing. Uh, when all put together, the whole assembly sits within three centimeters of the animal's skull. And so here's a photo of one of our marmosets with the assembly on his head and an illustration of the assembly with the clamshell housing open to show the head stage components. And here are average waveforms of 25 units that we've been able to record from the array implanted in this marmoset's sensory motor cortex. So far, I've presented a platform for voluntarily eliciting upper limb behavior and our setup for wireless neural recordings. In the last few slides, I will bring these two components together and present some of our preliminary simultaneous neural and behavioral data. Uh, to quantify the kinematics of upper limb movements, we're using an X-ray-based motion capture system where a combination of five-planar X-ray and radio-opaque markers placed in the arm and torso allow us to reconstruct seven degrees of freedom of the shoulder, wrist, and hand. So this video this is a video just to give you a sense of, of what that looks like. Um, on the left, we see a visible light video of marmoset engaging in some foraging. And on the right, we see x-ray video uh, of the same behavior where the, the markers in the arm are, are visible. And so here's an example of the kinematics of a foraging sequence simultaneously captured with neural data recorded with the W64 head stage. In this case, we've illustrated a single channel of raw neural data with the kinematics of the marmoset's reaching movements. Note the head stage and titanium pedestal mounted on the marmoset's head visible in the X-ray photograph. So in addition to the motor cortical encoding of upper limb kinematics, we're also interested in encoding spaces as they span the marmoset's natural motor repertoire.
To this end, we're beginning to record from uncontrained marmosets across their natural behavior repertoire. As an example, we have a raster of 10 minutes of neural activity recorded while this marmoset behaves within its home cage with eight bouts of foraging highlighted in yellow. In the photograph, you can see the marmoset during one such bout of foraging on the shelf with the head sage and housing in green in the top third of the, the cage. We're also currently working to develop a pipeline to use the, a combination of the accelerometer data shown in the central panel and the results of a computer vision detected track algorithm being developed by Frederice Perschel, a postdoc in the lab, to facilitate semi-supervised annotation of behavioral state for these unconstrained behavioral recordings. Ultimately, we're working to implement automated, voluntary, and parallel in-home cage neural and behavioral recordings that will allow us to extract behavioral state, upper limb kinematics, and neural activity from multiple marmosets at once. Additionally, we're working with TBSI toward a few further refinements of our W64 setup. Uh, one is a, a quick connect option to minimize handling further when attaching the RF transmitter and battery package. Uh, second, uh, uh, we're working on a solution for monitoring and recording signal loss events to optimize antenna placement and recording quality. And third, uh, we're working on a, a solution for remotely turning the head stage on and off when marmosets enter and leave the apparatus to preserve battery life. I'm going to talk about a project that uh, the Hayden Lab at the University of Minnesota and the Schieber Lab at the University of Rochester have been working on collaboratively now for almost a year. Uh, it's been a long time setting up, but we're finally starting to get data and we're pretty excited about it. So the um, the goal of this project is sort of twofold. We have two different labs with two different interests coming together. The Hayden Lab is very interested in foraging and uh, decision making in a natural context. We basically want to take this monkey who's out on the field site that we sometimes study, making foraging decisions, making food uh, consumption decisions. And we want to take something in the laboratory and make it as similar as possible to that and get as close to that as we can. And so the way that we do that is we're going to have a monkey moving uh, freely in a three-dimensional environment. And we're going to see that in a few slides. Um, and, but basically, we want to just liberate him from the chair and, and get free, freely moving decision making. The Schieber Lab, and uh, Adam is a, a research assistant professor in that lab. So in some ways, it's also the Rouse Lab is interested in motion and um, motor control. And they, of course, are very interested in pushing the envelope and moving towards the most natural and the most um, realistic motor movements as well. And so we have similar interests that have pushed us to work together and gotten us to uh, collaborate on this project. And we're going to tell you how that has proceeded today. So the uh, this here is kind of where it all happens. This is in our lab at the University of Minnesota. This is a nine foot by nine foot by nine foot cube uh, where the monkey can move around freely and as you can see at the top we have an optitrack system measuring where the monkey's position is in space and uh, the monkeys really love being in here they love exploring it and what happens what you can't see because it's not set up in this photo uh, is that there are six interactive panels that we have that we can move around to different places in the cage and the animal can see a little computer display he can uh, press a lever he can interact with it and he can get juice rewards and he can get food rewards. We like to give him grapes or M&Ms or something like that. And so they work in this cage and they uh, provide us with really exciting data. And Michael and Adam are gonna tell you a little bit about how we set up the monkey to give us that data and what that data looks like. All right, so just to give you a little further uh, insight into what's going on in the Schieber lab, um, we've been examining uh, neural trajectories in, uh, from large channel recordings. Um, I'm showing here the neural trajectories that we've observed during a reaching and grasping task when the monkey moved to eight different locations and four different objects. Um, and using principal component analysis, we can see 
what dimensions on the left best pull out the general task activity. Um, in the middle, I'm showing latent dimensions that separate location activity. And on the right, I'm showing latent dimensions that show uh, the separate object activity. Uh, so with these simple confined tasks, the neural activity tends to be constrained to these low dimensional spaces. Um, but what we're really interested in is how does this change and do these spaces potentially grow or shift um, when you do more diverse uh, naturalistic movements. So to that end, um, we've been working on developing this wireless uh, chronic recording. And so I'll first start by describing the surgery procedures. And so we've been using uh, these uh, 32 channel floating microarrays from microprobes. Um, we like these because we can chronically implant arrays as it allows, and allows us to record from multiple cortical areas simultaneously. Um, for the two different labs, we selected from four total cortical areas. Um, so for the Hayden lab, they're uh, commonly recording from anterior cingulate and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex for decision-making and executive control. In the Schieber lab, we have experience recording from dorsal premotor and primary motor cortex studying the neural control of movement. Um, so we were able to implant arrays into a single animal that recorded from all of these cortical areas. For the planning, uh, I used a beta version of a software called Cort Explore, uh, which is a visualization program uh, de developed at Rinnick Freevold's lab at the Roche at Rockefeller University by Stefan Schlaffelhopper. Our labs have also used commercial software by BrainSight and Amira, um, getting relatively similar results. Um, and what, what this allows us to do is we can customate, e customize each of the electrode links. Um, and for our experiment, our electrode lengths range from about one to 8.5 millimeters. So here's a, a picture of what, screenshot of what the Cord Explorer software looks like with the three MR slices on the left. Uh, for each array, we identified the target gray matter location to record from and an implant site on the cortical surface. Uh, this allows us to get a depth major, measurement of how long we should design the electrodes to be. Uh, we stagger the electrode length uh, about one to two millimeters to make sure we get good coverage. And we also adjust the depth um, so that the longer electrodes tend to be close to the sulcus. And so here you can see our surgical plan on the right on the surface reconstruction. So A, B, and C were in ACC, D and E were in DLPFC, arrays F and G are in dorsal premotor, and H, I, and J are in primary motor cortex. Uh, the surgical uh, implantation of the fabricated electrodes is definitely a team effort. Um, it takes about three or four lab members and it takes about 12 to 14 hours. Uh, we perform a craniotomy to remove the skull and a durotomy to expose the cortical surface. Uh, then using the azimuth and elevation approach angles that were calculated uh, with our software, uh, we then translate a micro manipulator along the surface of the brain uh, to Aligned uh, with the neighboring sulcus, and we use a micro manipulator to then implant the electrode ray, which is held by suction, uh, to slowly insert the electrodes. Then we release the suction, and the arrays remain in place. Um, we then close the dura and cover the, everything with methyl methacrylate. Here's a picture um, of what our chamber looks like after the implantation. Uh, you can see that there's 10. Uh, omnetics connectors that are embedded in acrylic in this 3 by 3.25 uh, inch chamber. Uh, one of the important things about these implantations of chronic electrodes is we need to make sure you get a good seal uh, with the methylene vacrylate to prevent infection. Um, we usually keep adding methylene vacrylate for one to two weeks after the surgery. Then uh, once we have a sealed chamber, we then have uh, this platform that was designed by PC TBSI um, that was 3D printed that holds the two 128 channel um, head stages and a custom electric electronic interface board um, that allows us to plug into the MX connectors into our electrode arrays. Then there's a custom uh, 3D printed cap that sits on top of the platform to cover the platform and head stages. Uh, the battery tucks into the side of the cap and there's a screw top lib lid that allows us to turn on and off the head stages. Now I'm going to just quickly talk about some of the initial recordings that we did. Uh, to start with, just to troubleshoot and test the system, we did some intermediate chair testing um, on tasks that the monkey was already trained to perform in the primate chair. And we compared these recordings uh, to a Ripple grapevine system um, that we use in the lab for data acquisition.
So here's a quick uh, description or schematic of the recording configuration that we're using. So we have two of these 128 channel TBSI head stages. They're then uh, projected or, the, or transmitted to the base stations. We have two of those that have uh, DB37 uh, adapters that are custom built uh, to interface with the front ends for the Ripple system. So those plug directly into the Ripple front ends or front ends plug directly into the Ripple system. And then we still use the Ripple grapevine system for our, uh, storing the data. And all of our data is sampled at 30 kilohertz. Um, as a comparison, we also can just plug the front ends from the Ripple system directly in the monkey when he's uh, fixed in a primate chair. And so that's uh, the initial testing that I'm going to show you. And so just briefly, here's some um, single units that we uh, identified on various channels with the TBSI system. Um, you can see that we get nice, clear single units um, that we're able to sort well. Um, in comparison to the wired system, we see that the um, SNR of the uh, sorted single units, um, the median for the wired system tended to be about 4.0, while the median uh, for the wireless system tended to be about three in our initial tests. Um, We've had a little bit of an issue in terms of getting a nice stable ground, um, and we're working to remedy that. Remedy that. Uh, so I expect that very likely we'll be able to get the TBSI system um, up closer to that, but there still is a lot of usable data that we can get even with the current system. So we tra trained the monkey, um, or the monkey had already been trained to do two uh, tasks in the primate chair. So just for initial testing, um, we did that. So. The monkey was trained to do a center out joystick reaching task, so he reached to one of eight different targets. He was also trained to do a gambling task, and so this gambling task forces him to choose from one of two different choices. Uh, those colors on the screen indicate the uh, type of uh, reward, the size of the reward that he's going to get, as well as the riskiness of getting that reward. Um, so there's a gambling component to the task. And I'll show you the neural data um, that we saw with these two different tasks. So First, just as a quick um, check with the center out task, we were able to get nice single units from primary motor cortex that were tuned uh, to the eight different reach directions. So in those eight different reach directions, we see a nice cosine fit. Um, as you would see, here's an example single unit of that. Um, so we're seeing that we're getting nice functional recordings in, with motor tasks. And then we also did um, analyze the gambling task. And so here we uh, recorded from a single unit and I'm showing the expected value, when the expected value of target one is greater than the expected value of target two, um, you can see the firing rate increases with that red trace. And so we see that this two, uh, neuron is functionally tuned um, to encoding those expected values of the gambling test. As uh, Adam covered, we have tested the macaque at the uh, traditional experimental rig, but we wanted to expand our project, not only at the uh, close distance, between the head stage and signal receiver at the uh, rig. So we here, we demonstrate the step that we have been taking to set up free ranging moving macaque. So uh, this consists of uh, multiple troubleshooting procedures that we have gone through with the uh, wire, uh, wireless system. But in, uh, in some, we get some good results that we can show you that uh, in the following uh, slides. So uh, the recruiting configuration is pre uh, pretty much the same uh, with the uh, intermediate chair test. But in here, on top of the neural data, we also collected the behavior data by two different camera systems. So one is OptiTrack, which has been uh, used, uh, widely used for tracking the motion. So we track that kinematic information in the real time. But on the other side, we installed 24 GoPro camera to track macaque joint and limb position. So uh, with the collaboration of the computer science uh, department at the University of Minnesota, uh, we uh, implemented multi-view bootstrapping algorithm. So now without having a marker in the monkey's body, now we can extract the kinematic information and the behavior notation uh, almost automatically. Here now we show the free ranging cage configuration. So we have uh, four computers uh, set up to control each devices. So first we have Ripple controls uh, computer, which uh, controls the Ripple recording system for neural data. And we have a computer that controls the uh, 
a screen a touch screen feeder which is controlled by the bluetooth signal so to remind you that uh we tested with the bluetooth signal uh, signal on and it was not interfering with the tbsi uh, system so we are we can say that we can confidently say that uh, now we are safe to use the touchscreen uh, system. Other two uh, computers are controlling the cameras, one for the OptiTrack control computer and one for the uh, GoPro processing computer. So all are uh, controlled by synchronized system box, so we can get like uh, time timestamp information for each data. So the video played in right column is actual monkey playing the uh, the uh, uh, foraging task. So the, as you should, as you see, there is a screen lighting up, and that gives information about like how we, I mean how much reward he get or how risky the reward is. And the left is the prototype of our feeder, and the monkey uh, whenever a monkey press the button or uh, by his hand or like his mouth, he get a squirt of juice. So and we control the amount of juice very precisely by the Arduino systems. So from this slide, we will show step by step uh, troubleshooting that Hayden Lab and Shiber Lab has gone through. So we first question the effect of the uh, big metal mesh that we have in the cage. So in here, we located antenna inside the cage and place the head stage both inside and outside of the cage. So in some two conditions differ by whether cage is blocking the head stage from the antenna or not. So distance between the antenna and the head stage was controlled for both <coughs> conditions as a three feet. Uh, on the right, our results show that the median value of uh, out cage condition is a uh, median value of the signal to noise ratio for the out, uh, out cage condition was a little bit uh, smaller than the in-cage condition. So uh, this indicates the putting antenna at the same side of the head stage will be better for getting uh, good signals. So we also next tested the distance dependency of the signal quality. Uh, this is because our cage was uh, very large, which is nine feet by nine feet by nine feet. Uh, we worried that the signal might be dropped after a particular distance. So in this condition, we tested both two feet and five feet, uh, but the signal to noise ratio is uh, almost comparable. But the problem we got in here was once the head stage was uh, beyond five feet distance from the antenna, the signal was dropped. So we had to order extra device that uh, amplifies the gain, and that which we're gonna show at the next uh, slide. So uh, TBSI, um, uh, we worked with TBSI for gain amplifier, and the purpose of it, it was overcoming the signal drop according to distance increase. So we expect that even if we go beyond five feet, we want to get stable uh, signal. So as you see the picture, there's a two SMA uh, cable comes out. One end is connected to receiver, and one end is connected to uh, actual antenna. So in here, uh, we uh, placed the monkey as far as possible, so the 10 feet distance from the antenna, and we compared the signal with the uh, two feet distance, which was uh, shown previously. So the signal to noise ratio between the close and far, as you see in the right, differs a little bit. So uh, if you go very far from the antenna, still the um, SNR is decreasing, but the uh, remarkable thing in here is that we get almost similar number of units even if you go very far. And also, uh, the, there was no signal drop, even if we go beyond five feet. So now we can uh, stably get the signal even though uh, the monkey is uh, located anywhere else in the big cage. So uh, until now, we show the troubleshooting steps that we have gone through and we are pretty confident that we get uh, some source of data and we want to more expand in the future. So still, but there's a remaining technical obstacles. So still like uh, for a good isolated unit, we get less motion artifact, 
but with a, a units that has low signal to noise ratio, it's very subjective to the motion artifact. So it's, our goal is to de uh, develop a method to remove it. And this links to with the uh, this links with the grounding issues. So uh, we expect if we get better stable ground, uh, we expect that uh, motion artifacts goes down. And actually, uh, we are not. Uh, Adam has developed some method to reduce down the uh, ground. I mean, uh, motion artifact by having uh, stable external ground in their head stage. So data collection wise. Uh, we are also expect to collect stable LSP data collection once we remove the motion artifact. And uh, we are expecting to get the uh, OptiTrack and MultiView bootstrapped behavior notation as soon as possible. So design issue, finally, is that the cap design, many people might be uh, uh, puzzled because we have open uh, whole space at the top of the cap. But um, that was, uh, initially designed for the uh, easy turn on, turn off, and battery uh, attachment and detachment. Still, we figure out that we can make it better. We can improve. Uh, we can uh, improve the easiness of attachment and detachment of battery. And also, uh, we worry about the case that where monkey puts his finger at the open hole. So we are now uh, making a cap that is that has closed hole. Uh, on top of the cap. So the final issue is that as we shown you that uh, putting antenna inside the cage improves the signal, but we also have the wor a worry that monkey might damage it. So we are now um, brainstorming about the uh, about the fact that whether we can put antenna inside without monkey damaging it. So this is all we had, and we want to. Uh, thank people who helped helped us developing this project. Of course, the uh, biggest collaborator, Mark Schieber, at the University of Rochester, uh, gave us a lot of advice for the surgical procedure. And uh, Paul Sagan lab, Benjamin Eisenrich, and the previous um, technical associate, Mark Mancerola, helped us training Monkey for doing freely moving uh, tasks. What a question from Sebastian and Jeffrey. Um, they've asked, do you get any interference from the metal frame of the cage? And are there any um, signal reflections? Oh, so um, for the Sebastian's uh, question, we've shown our data that um, the, we can still collect the data even with a big uh, metal mesh. And once you place the antenna inside of the cage so that head stage and antenna can stay in the same side, we almost get no interference with the metal mesh. Uh, and I think that also answers it, uh, Jeff, Ad uh, Jeff Adams' question. So we could, I mean, we could get some good signal uh, inside the cage. Perfect. Um, Robbie, I have a couple of questions for you that have come in um, regarding TVSI specifically. Do you have currently a 384 channel system available? Yes, this is available now. So we have um, channel counts ranging from five channels all the way to 384. Excellent. And does TBSI make custom adapters for different electrodes and arrays? Yes, so uh, depending on what the customer has, uh, we will work with you guys. We make custom adapter boards or cables to adapt to whatever setup you guys currently do for your surgical procedures. Great, thank you. Um, and this can be um, for you as well, Robbie, or uh, gentlemen from the labs. You guys can weigh in on this as well, as I'm sure it's probably different. But what is the weight of the device sitting on um, on the animal's head? Um, I can just weigh in, and at least in the standard weights that we have for the 128 channel uh, by itself, it's around seven to seven and a half grams. 
So, um, and for the uh, 64 channel that we developed for uh, the Hasopoulos lab, it was a little bit different, but total um, would probably range around five to six grams. And um, if I'm a little off, the, any of the lab members can weigh in. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that was that was consistent with what you said. Perfect. Actually, Nico, while we've got you, why did your group specifically choose marmosets? We chose marmosets, well, the real reason, and then we can, and then we made up reasons later on, but the real reason was uh, that we, uh, I had begun a collaboration with Jason McLean, who's an expert in optical imaging, and we wanted to do, um, we wanted to do optical calcium imaging uh, using a uh, a primate species with a smooth cortex and and so that and and also given their small size we could image uh you know there's there was less risk of um of he, uh, brain movement within the skull because we, we know that there's actually less space between the brain and and the skull and in, in smaller species so so that was the initial reason uh and and also the fact that with these uh, array recordings we could uh, with Utah arrays in particular which only can target down to about a millimeter and a half we could image I mean we could record from the entire motor cortex as well as somatosensory cortex without having to deal with the uh, the sul sulci that exist in macaques um, and then uh, then later on of course we realized that um, you know, down the road, we could we will be able to take advantage of transgenic marmosets um, and all the capabilities that will provide us with. But that was that came later. Okay. And how much noise and what sort of noise do you have to deal with when using the wireless system? So, I'd say with with our system, we we have two main sources of of noise, we have movement artifacts and then um, effects on signal quality related to uh, distance and, and line of sight obstruction. And we're still sort of trying to get a, a more precise handle on the um, the quantity of, of these these sources of noise. Well, yeah, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to record a measure of signal quality in, in real time and in, in not too long and um, for quantifying movement artifacts we're working on a, a movement uh, a detected track algorithm to to track the movement of the marmosets that will allow us to correlate noise with with movement um, but the short answer is we're, we're still getting a, a more precise handle on the the types and extent of, of noise. But that said, I'd say 90% of our um, our recordings are pretty much artifact free to, to my eyes. That's great, thanks. That's great. And Jeff, actually, we'll have you. Dave, can you record a good signal? Um, or good single and multi-unit activity with the Utah array in, in the marmoset? Um, how many days? Uh, yes. So, uh, well, I guess there are a couple of ways to answer that. Um, well, with the, the current setup, we have a, a battery that lasts about three hours, uh, three or four hours, rather. Um, and so it depends on how we, we budget that time. Um, and we're, as I mentioned toward the end of the presentation, we're working with TVSI to come up with a solution to turn the head stage on and off when the uh, marmosets enter and, and leave the apparatus. So if we're only interested in the foraging behavior within the apparatus, which um, only really happens in these spurts of, of on the order of 10 seconds at a time throughout the day, um, we can maximize 
uh, battery life and and potentially record for many days on end. Um, but yeah, I guess the the short answer is it depends on how we budget that that battery life. Um, and just to um, add to that, just, uh, uh, Robbie from GBSI, uh, we can adjust battery sizes depending on the length of recording times needed. So. Um, as Jeff mentioned, each uh, each kind of head stage has its own current draw that it's using, um, and so we can adjust the size of the battery uh, depending on what's needed from uh, recording time wise. Great, thanks. Um, Hayden Group, do you guys have anything to pick in about how long your recording time is with the macaques? Basically, yeah, we have we have a similar you know three to four hour window. I think we actually haven't really pushed it um, yet. We you know been been uh, our typical setup is, you know, doing these tasks for an hour, an hour and a half, and it's been more than enough for that. Um, so, so currently, um, you know, we really we've been doing kind of the typical paradigm of doing a task for an hour and a half for the monkey, and that's how long they work. So, um, like I said, we've had more than enough battery, really. So, backing up the Adam's information, I have tested the battery life. Uh, I mean, connecting one battery into two the two head stage, it lasts longer than six hours. So it's more than sufficient of the time span that Bacac is working per day. Perfect, thank you. Um, Michael, this is a good question for you. Um, do, in your experience, have you had any um, damage to the head stage because of, um, because of the macaques interacting with it? Um, or have you noticed any damage from so them that, at all? Uh, that was surprising part for us because even though there was a hole inside, I mean, up on top of the cap, they didn't uh, damage the head stage or anything. And also, while they were hanging on the uh, big metal cage, they adjust their height so that their cap doesn't hit the ceiling of the cage. So we uh, tested that for a day or two, and it was consistent across those two days. Great, thank you. Um, Hatsopolis group, I'm not sure if maybe this is a good question for you, but can can the monkeys live together in social groups with the helmets? Or do you have any experience um, with social housing? Uh, yeah, uh, most of our marmosets are, are paired. So there's a, a male and female pair in each cage. Um, and uh, as far as we can tell, the um, that doesn't interfere with the recordings. Um, they, they they don't seem to bother with the the head stage, either the one wearing it or uh, that one's partner. Thank you. Um, and I have a question here from Ivan, um, and I'll ask uh, each group separately. So um, Jeff and Nico, what clay um, did you use to glue the wires going from the electrodes? So. For us, we just use methyl methacrylate or dental cement um, to take the wires up out of, you know, there's a craniotomy edge, we tack it down with the acrylic at the edge, um, and then we uh, cover the dura with duragen and then just use more acrylic. So it's really all acrylic um, that we use to hold everything in place. 